Assalamu alaikum and welcome back. You're watching Let's Talk. My name is Anwar Mir and we are discussing, <laughs> discussing the Uyghur community in China. If you've just tuned in, uh, I'm delighted to say I have two absolutely wonderful experts uh, spot on for this particular topic. Um, to my uh, right is Abbas Fez who's a South Asia analyst, you've seen him before, on this channel, lecturer at Essex University, and a good friend to the community. And also, another good friend is Duncan Bartlett. He's the editor of the prestigious Asian Affairs magazine, and, um, uh, and he's also um, had a fantastic spell with the BBC, so very learned there too. Before we went off air, ladies and gentlemen, we were discussing this <coughs> particular uh, um, issue uh, with uh, Abbas Fez, uh, but we were trying to sort of take a different uh, dimension or look at it from a different dimension to the extent of um, looking at the international community and seeing uh, what sort of assistance, when I say assistance may not be the right word, but certainly what sort of um, governments would be amenable to looking at the uh, gross human rights abuses that are taking place as we speak in China. Uh, and um, I should also say that there is a number at the bottom of your screens, should you wish to participate in, and let us know your thoughts uh, on this particular topic, do feel free to call in. Uh, we cut you off earlier on because we had to have a, uh, a commercial break. Uh, what we were trying to uh, develop in terms of the discussion was the fact that uh, you ticked off the various difficulties that certain countries would have, uh, the constraints uh, that they would have in uh, criticizing China or at the very least having a whisper with China uh, because of various commercial interests, uh, geopolitical interests, all sorts of other sorts of uh, uh, political uh, interests that there may be consequences to. And I had flagged up the position of, say, America, the United mm -hmm. States, where, in, in, in my view, um, looking at the current state of affairs, looking at the uh, kind of comments that have recently, in fact, been made by President Trump, uh, in relation to the uh, the phone giant uh, Huawei and uh, the kind of volatility in terms of their relationship. Your take, please, mm -hmm. uh, on uh, why America should not be looked at. I know they're not great friends of the Muslim nations at the moment. Well, it depends which way you look at it. Uh, but in terms of this particular issue, they seem to be not very shy of criticizing mm -hmm. China mm -hmm. at the moment. Can they not be leveraged? Uh, they have a strong leverage, yes, definitely. But if you allow me, I would like to actually say that this whole question yep. has got three different dimensions. Okay. One is the United States, the other one is China, uh, and the relationship between the United States and China. But the, there is a third dimension to all of this, and that is the rest of us, the human rights defenders, you know, third world countries, countries that are developing and all of that. So the kind of uh, debate and the controversy between China and the United States is a real one. But it is, you know, something that is really happening between those two countries. Because for a very long time, the United States has been the dominant power in the world. Now China is emerging as a dominant power. So there is some kind of clash of interests, but there is also another dimension to that clash. Because in the United States, we've got free media, we've got you know, free judiciary. So if something goes wrong, you can take even you know, Trump to court if, you know, mm -hmm. if it gets to that point. Yeah. Yeah. In China, you don't have those possibilities. And the Chinese government knows that they do not have those possibilities. So China, there are reports, and I'm not really making this up, there are reports that the Chinese government is spending huge sums of money in order to uh, create this image of itself in Western countries as a kind of, you know, benevolent force. But in reality, it is not. It cannot be a benevolent force. Why, cannot, why can it not be a benevolent uh, force? Because in China, you are not allowed to criticize the government. At the same time, Chinese know-how is you know, developing, and especially in the area of, of uh, saving data and in the area of social media, they are able, they are capable of manipulating yeah. social media in Western countries 
in, in, in a way that really Western countries are not able to manipulate uh, uh, kind of social media in China because of the <coughs> censorship in China, because you know, we know what happened in, you know, during the Tiananmen uh, Square protests. So, I mean, since then, China, Chinese government has not allowed anybody to criticize that government. So there is, in a way, you know, there is, there is, something, there is something positive for us human rights defenders mm. in the development of this kind of you know controversy between the United States and China yep. and there is something negative about that the positive side is that really you know two uh, superpowers are really kind of talking to each other or or uh, or fighting each other over trade and other issues including you know the Huawei issue mm. which has you know direct connection with the entire process because you know I mean whatever you want to think about it you know democracy in the West can become under attack mm. and it can be really you know exposed to serious danger mm. so whatever I mean it is in the form of Trump one may have a lot of reservations about you know the way he handles I know that his some of his comments are completely out of order as a human rights defender sure. I cannot actually support what he says sure. but this you know kind of debate that is going on between the United States and China or this you know kind of con confrontation inevitably is not going to be against human rights I think it is going to be to push China to the point where because at the moment we have a lot of problems with China. Sure. If you allow me to continue, uh, for example, um, according to the research that I have done, uh, any closeness in South Asian countries to China has been coupled with increased repression of the opposition in those countries. You think of Rajapaksa in Sri Lanka uh, before uh, the current you know, uh, prime minister in Pakistan. We know what you know, the situation was like that. Maldives is the same. Bangladesh is really coming into the same kind of fray. Um, we, we know what is happening you know, in terms of really the close relationship that exists between Myanmar and China and the uh, kind of impact of that on the political situation in Myanmar, on, the repre on repression on human rights in Myanmar. Uh, on, you know, in Nepal, there is another problem that is growing up. So we, any country that you can think of, you know, I mean, Philippines, you know, the um, uh, go government leader in, in the Philippines has jokingly said that the Philippines is a province of China. So, I mean, they are just, they are not, not only really uh, trying to use the Chinese know-how, and of course China expands in that, but also they are trying to model themselves on Xi Jinping, become president for life. So, I mean, that, you know, think of what that means for the minorities in those countries, what that means for the opposition in those countries, what that means for the freedom of expression and freedom of and, you know, access to judiciary and other human rights issues. Uh, fascinating insight. Thank you very much, uh, Abbas Faiz Duncan. You have uh, devoted uh, uh, your life effectively to uh, commentating on international affairs. And obviously, because of the, uh, because of the public nature of your commentary, you have had to take a, a balanced approach and you know, argue both sides. Can you argue China? Well, let's have a look at it as how the Chinese might present this. Mm. Um, first of all, I think this is an issue which has been highlighted by the international media over and over again. If you look at Google and you find, you put in the word Uyghur and you put in the word Xinjiang, you will see a lot of stories which are very critical of China, presenting it as being a human rights abuse. What the Chinese might say is, this is a domestic matter. We had a problem with terrorism, we had a problem with separatism, we had a restive minority in an underdeveloped part of our country. We have invested heavily in that part of the country, we've tried to integrate them, and we've stamped out terrorism. Yes, we may have had to take some quite stern measures to do so by putting a lot of people in detention centres, and of course there is a debate about really what happens in those detention centres, but they would say, 
other countries really don't have the right to criticise us on this kind of issue. Don't you all take measures against terrorism when mosques are attacked in New Zealand or schools are, are, are shot by um, uh, people with guns in the United States or there are terrorist attacks in Westminster in the United Kingdom? You take security measures and it's not up to other countries to criticise or comment on that. We've decided to take the security measures which we think are appropriate for our particular situation. But of course that's the point of view of the mainstream in China, the Han Chinese, the majority. And it's a point of view which is expressed by the Chinese Communist Party. The reason why I think this is so significant is because every country in the world, not just Muslim, not, major, not just Muslim majority countries like Pakistan and Bangladesh, but every country in the world has some difficult decisions to make about how much they're going to partner with China economically. China is reaching out to every country in the world saying, be part of our Belt and Road Initiative. If you trade with us, we will invest heavily in your infrastructure. But the big question that many countries are saying is, what does that mean politically? Will we have to toe the Chinese line? Will we have to quieten our criticism of things that we think are wrong in China, for example, the Uyghur situation? Does it mean that we'll have to sign up to doing deals with Chinese state-owned enterprises like Huawei, the controversial telephone company that we're talking about? What does it actually mean to be in partnership with China? How much political independence could we take if we do a deal with China? And remember that many of the countries that are talking about being partners with China are much, much smaller economically than China is. China's an absolute giant. The only country which is bigger than China at the moment in terms of its overall GDP is the United States. And the United States, as you said, is enmeshed in a big, trade war with China and that's as a result of China's economy growing so large it's soon set to take America to overtake America and become the biggest and most powerful economy in the world. It's very interesting what you say all of which is all of which is interesting uh, but one or two things if I may just uh, very slightly labor um, the other countries apart from America if you park that aside for a moment uh, we've heard from um, uh, about, about uh, say Pakistan. Now we know that, for example, uh, one of the biggest investments that Pakistan, China is making in Pakistan is the Gwadar region mm -hmm. of Balochistan, the coastal uh, um, part of that, and the huge deep sea uh, port that, that is being built there. We know about the huge investment in Africa, throughout Africa. China has a huge presence, amazing presence there. And of course, even in other countries, countries which don't have such um, uh, such big economies, nevertheless, they're very much um, dependent to various degrees uh, economically to China. So it's not surprise, it's no surprise that a number of countries, for a number of different reasons, will be reluctant to, um, to actually criticize China. But aside from the countries by way of the flag-bearing nations, individuals, I mean, if you look at, and I, I was discussing this earlier on with yourself, um, if you look at, for example, uh, what, what, what George Clooney uh, did w in relation to Brunei. Now, that wasn't America speaking, that was George Clooney speaking. That had a domino effect and the social media uh, 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 took it up, up by storm. And then other countries had to commentate because uh, they, they could not. Um, and eventually we see that Brunei has had to respond, and I think their response was fantastic. Um, but in any event, um, in terms of Brunei's position as a sovereign nation, um, they have defended themselves. Uh, what we're saying, nevertheless, is that the pressure that Brunei must be under, uh, not just the economic pressure, because Brunei has a, a reasonably solvent economy uh, rather well in comparison to other countries in that region, but nevertheless, uh, Brunei w w would feel it. Uh, the rulers of Brunei, the Sultan and, and the, the advisors around him uh, will, will feel it and they'll, 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 you know, they'll be open to that criticism uh, and it's affecting them. Similarly, could there not be or should there not be, if no governments criticizing China because of the huge uh, 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 entity that China is. Nevertheless, what about individuals whose voices do carry weight? Uh, you know, uh, is that not something that should take place? Or should the Chinese be allowed to incarcerate three million people, murder God knows how many others, and essentially just um, uh, wipe out and erase from history the Chinese population of China, the Muslim population of China? Very briefly, you've got a minute. 
how do you get China to change its mind? That's something that Donald Trump wakes up thinking every morning. And <coughs> his response was to impose massive tariffs on all the Chinese imports into the United States. And that's actually got quite wide cross-party support in America, actually. Surprisingly, a lot of the Democrats support that approach as well. Has it led to much difference in the way the Chinese Communist Party approaches things? Not really. Um, you know, the Chinese Communist Party has still decided that it's going to take centralist control. And certainly when it comes to domestic affairs, what the Chinese see as being maintaining stability and uh, suppressing the threat of terrorism, they're not going to take lectures from other countries, let alone the United States. Duncan, I must stop you there only for time reasons. Ladies and gentlemen, we must go on to a another break. And when we come back, we will hope to continue this discussion, inshallah. So do stay tuned. Uh, don't go too far. And we hope to be back in a very short moment. Mm -hmm.